We're normally here to answer your game gaming or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So due to the timing of when this particular episode is being recorded right now on December 28th, and when it drops, which is on January 3rd, I decided to put that question hat aside for the tonight and instead spend some time looking back at 2022, at least as far as it pertains to us and tabletop gaming and not current social events or <laughs> other problems we had in our lives or any of that. Just from the gaming side of things, this is a retrospective on the board games we played. Now, while we've been impacted by the world around us in various ways, it has at least gotten better. That's true. So first off, I got to say 2022 felt like we did a lot more gaming. We played a lot more games. We tried a lot more things. We got together with people and gamed more often. Um, and it definitely was in the case of in-person gaming. There were no full-on lockdowns. We were forced to stay in our homes for multiple days, which meant more gaming with people in our bubble. Now, we did tend to stick to a bubble. So we gained more with Tori and Kat, as well as the extended family going over to Brenda's house. While we never got to the point where we felt tra comfortable traveling or attending any cons, uh, at least myself in particular, we spent way more time playing physical games at the table and less time on Board Game Arena, which is where I spent most of my gaming time last year. I finally got to swing down to Windsor a little bit more, at least until I moved here and started seeing you even less. Well, that, that's <laughs> shifting a bit the other way, finally. <laughs> we're, we're starting to hang out a little bit more. Um, part of the, I think our entire problem is like two months were a write-off this year, and that's, again, not gaming-related, but I think it impacts some of the numbers we're going to talk about today. Now, one of the awesome things that did happen, uh, especially since no one seemed to get sick off of it, is by the end of the year, I actually hosted my first public play event since 2019. I was over at a new venue for us, the Barbershop Bar on Howard, and I've got to say it was nice to be out sharing the hobby with the public again. This was not a board gamer event at a hobby game store. This was very much a public play event with gamers and non-gamers and curious people there, and that was really awesome. This is the big thing I'm looking forward to in 2023, is this becoming a more regular occurrence. And heck, I'll announce it right now for anyone who happens to be in the Windsor, Essex area. We're looking at January 21st. I'm going to confirm that date right here. Yes, January 21st as our next event at the Barbershop Bar. Indeed. While the world has not recovered and we all need to act a little differently in this new normal going forwards, we are going forwards. And that means more gaming as well as so much more. So I think the biggest thing that's happened this past year, though, as far as our show is concerned and the tabletop bellhop, our podcast, and all our content is Sean moving down here to the Windsor area. While we haven't gotten together as often as we would have liked so far due to a bunch of garbage happening in November and October, it's already had an impact on the number of games we've gotten to play with the huge advantage. And I think this is the biggest change you're going to see going forward with the show of Sean now being able to actually play most, if not all, of the games we review. Though it does mean the end of Sean Con. Indeed, no more Sean Con, but... Hopefully the first of several boosts to our content that are coming, starting with my proximity, meaning I can play more of the games we review in person, as well as just play more games in general. Mm -hmm. But also with the ability to pass around components, I can add more content to the video reviews that we were never able to previously do. Right. Hopefully increasing the, their value to people even further beyond just this show, but into the YouTube realm as well. Yeah, our video on demand content should be getting better, possibly even our blog videos, depending on what we do for pictures and stuff like that. Not blog videos, blog pictures. Uh, as well, uh, we're going to be using some of Sean's expertise to try to set up the new recording area, though I don't even really want to talk about that too much because I'm going to promise something in January and it'll be done in December. But it is something that is coming soon to our show. All right, so let's get to the games, right? The numbers, some numbers and games lists and, and feedback and stats and all that fun data nerds seem to enjoy. Um, now, all of my data this year is coming from Board Game Geek. Um, there's going to be some holes because of that. Um, some of the types of games we've been reviewing, especially recently, aren't listed on Board Game Geek because they are more puzzles than board games. Though it's odd some of the stuff that is listed there, like I'm kind of baffled by what I can and can't find. 
Uh, the other thing that I didn't really dive into, and uh, you know what, we'll save this for later, is RPGs. But when we get to the end of what I've got listed here, I do want to talk about RPGs just a little bit. So what I want to start with is how many games did we each play? How many games did we play? Based on the board game geek, it looks like about 300 games. Now, I know I forgot to log plays. Like, I know there's certain ones, and I'm usually pretty good, but I always forget a few. Plus, like I said, there's games that don't exist on board game geek like what we played on christmas eve i can't log a play of that the two games we're reviewing tonight i can't log plays of though i don't know how i'd log a play anyway but I'd at least log one if not multiple every time i sat down with it maybe i've had 82 plays i don't even know <laughs> but those were navy logs so it looks like about 300 games um what impressed me was 79 different games and that always impresses me because people do these like 21 and 22, you know, whatever, like uh, 91 and nine in 1990 or whatever, where they try to play like so many different games. And I'm like, well, I played 79 different games this year. Um, and again, that's board game geek based. So I actually think it might be a little higher because of some of the games that aren't listed. Now, I will say both those numbers are lower than last year on both counts. But these were more in-person plays. I played a lot of board game arena last year. That was my main way to game. And it's really easy to try a new game on board game arena. How many things last year did we play once or we went on Yukata and tried to figure <laughs> out Bruges or whatever. So, so my number of games last year was significantly higher, but mainly because we were stuck at home and trying to kill time and trying to interact and try to do stuff with Sean. So we played games and we were trying all kinds of things. Yeah. So I've actually played 225 times this year, nice. but only 57 different ones. And those numbers are pretty accurate. I'm I'm pretty persistent when it comes to logging. Mm. And I also don't, I, I haven't played the Strange Escape stuff that you guys yes. have. So <laughs> those, that hasn't, uh, well, Strange for BGG. Um, yes. That hasn't thrown off my numbers by not being able to log mm -hmm. uh, that stuff. Now, Sadly, 75% of my games were still played on Board Game Arena. All right. Next, we're going to take these lists and we're going to break them down. And I think what we'll do is we'll do kind of a top 10. We don't usually do top 10. So I fear for this episode, let's do a top 10 because why not? These are going to be our 10 most played games. Um, we're going to say a little bit about each of them. I don't want to just run through the list and be done. I want to, I want to say, you know, what we liked about them or whatever, not a full on description of how to play or what the games are about. Now we're going to start at number 10. So this is our least played of the top 10 first working up to our most played game. So number 10 for me, I, and, and this was a bit of a surprise was Gorinto. I really love Gorinto. Gorinto is fantastic. Now, the reason this is so high this year is we were playtesting and trying out the new expansion, which unfortunately is a Barnes & Noble exclusive, which you can only get and when you buy the game at Barnes & Noble. But I will say it's a cool expansion. It adds like an areas where you can score more points if you take tiles from a certain area. Overall, though, we've said a ton about Corinto over the years. It's a fantastic abstract tile drafting game that we still enjoy. It's one I broke out to the barbershop bar and people loved it. I knew as soon as I got that game, the finished product out in people's hands. Now, ironically, I just realized this. Remember I said my last gaming event was in 2019? We brought the prototype of Gorinto <laughs> to that event and played it. Dude, and I just mode. realized that <laughs> our last public play event I hosted, I brought the prototype. My most recent public play event, I brought the production copy. So the, how do you like that for service there, Mark, from uh, Grand Gamers Guild? I just clicked <laughs> in. I'm like, wait a minute. There we go. All right, what was your 10? So my number 10 was Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, I, which I only actually got to play, I think maybe once, maybe twice in I person think we did with twice. you. Uh, twice. And, and that was, interestingly, it was in the middle of my play. So I, I started playing it on Board Game Arena, struggled a little bit, <laughs> played it in person with you, and then understood it so much better oh, yeah. when we went back to it at Board mm -hmm. Game Arena. It's uh, definitely a game you want to learn in person <laughs> before playing, you know, unless unless you're the type who can learn from, you know, watch it played videos or, or whatever. I, for me... That game did not click for me until mm. I played it in person. Uh, so much of the components of that game matter. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a tactile game, even though there's nothing tactile or dexterous about it. Uh, but a, uh, a good game, even though I don't necessarily agree that most people say it's a deck builder. 
Um, that's the, the smallest portion of that game is the deck building mm-hmm. component. Uh, but yeah, that was my number 10. My number nine is Point Salad. And I actually am shocked this isn't higher up on the list. So I have a feeling this is one where I logged one play for an entire night of play with multiple plays. So I think this probably should be higher on the list. It's one of those, like, I'm sure I logged every time the game came out. I'm just not sure I logged every play because what happens with Point Salad is we sit down and we play two, three, four, sometimes five times in a row. If it's just DNI, we tend to do the three game one to get your total score. And do you log that as one play because it's a two player variant or is that three plays of point salad? But anyway, I played a ton of point salad. This is a great game. I did not bring this one up to the barbershop bar, but Deanna did and taught one of our friends, taught taught a local how to play who dug it. This is one I expect is going to be possibly on this list again next year. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all, especially um if people figure out that it's on board game arena uh, just mm-hmm. in general because it's so easy to play and you know whether you're playing it in person or playing it online it's really easy to just go to sit down and have a couple of plays uh, yep. of uh point salad uh my number nine is deus um which is really interesting because i still don't know how to play deus uh, it's the ninth most played game of the year. I've still never read the instructions, watched <laughs> it as it played. Um, it's It's been interesting. It's fun. I like it as a game. It's in, uh, But uh, it, it's one of those games that came up on Board Game Arena, and we've played f- through it a few times, and uh, it seems obvious enough for the most part. The first time through, I had no idea what I was doing. Completely lost. Uh, and I don't think any of us actually did. <laughs> um, but I, I did pick up a couple of things and I think you'd mentioned a couple of things about it. Yeah. Pa- just kind of how it works. In passing, yep. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, well that makes sense. Now I understand mm-hmm. why that whole section of the board that I never d- did anything with is there. Um, but yeah, so despite not understanding it uh, very well at all, my ninth game was Deus. So I actually brought my copy up. I told, I think it's a little too blurry to see in the video, but it's, <laughs> it's behind my shelf back behind my shoulder back there. And we really should probably sit down and play a game. I just don't, I don't think out, we'll do yeah. that this Friday, but just to <laughs> figure it out, I'll have to relearn it. I really, I, all I remember is you try to get the same type of gods because when you play one, they all go off kind of like gizmos. That's, that's what I remember of it. And it had a weirdly shaped board. Yep. I don't remember much else, but yeah, Deus, it, I have not played this even at all this year. I, I don't know when I played my copy, <laughs> but I do have it, but I think it might have the arnak effect on sean and it'll suddenly make more sense all right my number eight is space base which doesn't surprise me at all uh this is just everyone likes this game uh from my kids including my youngest which doesn't always enjoy like this is this one's on the borderline for too complex for her but she loves it uh to my mother-in-law who loves this game i don't expect this one to change and this i haven't been able to bring out the public play events but i think once i do it's going to be even more popular, especially the high player counts. I think I might actually get like the command station will get some use with some, you know, six, seven player games of space base. Um, my only mess up with space base. I totally forgot to put the new story expansion on my wish list this year for Christmas. Kind of should have did that because man, we are loving space base. I don't think that's another one. I expect that my plays are just going to continue into the new year. Fair enough. Uh, so my number eight was splendor. And again, this is digital. Uh, it's such a fantastic game, uh, what in person or digital. Again, it's 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 like uh, point salad in that way. It really plays perfectly well either way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the nice thing about digital is you don't have to clean it up afterwards. <laughs> and the, That's true. And the setup is and the setup is super fast. Um, so no shuffling at all. But yeah, I I love I love Splendor, and I was really glad to have it on that they have it on BGA now, so that I could get in a number of plays. Nice. Uh, seven was earlier on Sean's list. I played more Arnak than he did, which is kind of surprising based on how many PGA games we got going. But I think Sean was in every one I was in. I, Arnak's just great. Like I, in in this case, most of my plays were BGA, but there were a number of in-person plays. I think I did at least five in-person plays before we even did the digital. I don't know. Um, this is one of the few games that I kept playing on Board Game Arena after I basically stopped playing on board game arena it was the one that i would like yeah okay let's go one more round okay let's go one more round (laughs) and if i got invited i didn't turn it down and i kept playing uh fantastic game um i don't know what you call if it's not a deck builder deck it's (laughs) not deck construction it's a card game with some deck it's it's definitely not the focus i would not call it a deck building game but it has deck building elements it's much more it's it's worker placement resource management engine building 
Yep. Um, so yeah, definitely Lost Ruins of Arnak is is on my list at number seven. And again, oh, I'm thinking seven, seven plays. It's not seven <laughs> plays, it's probably more than that at yep. this point. Um, so yeah, Arnak, still love it. What I'm not sure is how much more I'll keep playing that one with my physical copy. That is unless I pick up Expedition Leaders. I have a feeling if I pick that up, there's going to be a big push to start playing that one again. Fair enough. Uh, so my number seven is Tapestry. Uh, and thank God I got to play this in person first because <laughs> this one would be rough to try and learn digitally. Uh, I'm sure this is probably on uh, one of Dee's top games of the year, uh, played games of the year, considering she's gone on to do the tournament thing on Board Game Arena. But being able to play this in person a few times, and we've, we've played it more than oh, once yeah. in person, uh, and then take that knowledge and move it on to the, the digital version, which isn't perfect. Uh, the digital version has got some quirks to it, it's, because it's uh, a tricky some game. Of the it's, it's some a, of the ways you can't reverse like things don't yeah. quite work the way that you wouldn't make those mistakes in person that, yeah. that's what i found frustrating yeah with that. No, I, absolutely 100 uh tapestry i obviously got to in some plays this year love the game fantastic game just didn't make my top 10 <laughs> there sean is the deanna is currently playing a tournament <laughs> exactly. game of yep. tapestry here we go uh next one for me is the game which i could make fun of its name oh i guess i just did sorry um, this one, you can blame date nights um, and stayovers in Kingsville. Deanna and I have played a lot of two-player games of the game while enjoying great local beers and local food. Uh, the small package, small, very small table presence, like all you need is four stacks of cards, uh, simplicity of the gameplay. But not only that, I started playing this one with my kids more often. The, the few nights we had like board game night with the kids, this came out. So I kind of shocked, like, like in a way, but I still dig it. Like this is possibly the oldest game on my list. That's still seeing that much play. Fair enough. Uh, for me, number six was space base, which we've already talked about. Uh, but I, because I didn't play through Pluto, right. uh, I played, I played before and after and with Pluto, but not the play through of Pluto. I think that's why my, uh, uh is oh, a little, little, no, mine's actually higher than yours. Yo, then, yeah. yo, you know what? That's right. Because I was playing. You were playing on. Board I was Game playing Arena. on board game arena when you weren't. Uh, yeah. So even though you played Pluto, I have actually played this yeah, more than you. Say. But because of the. Uh, oh well, well maybe speak... not. It's re relatively not. Yes. You may have actually it's... had more plays. Yeah, they said the, the. I didn't look up the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, so. Next for me, number five would be all the boss doors of Cartagena. Uh, this is another one that Deanna and I like to play on date night games that actually played surprisingly well two player. And often we would sit down, we'll play two or three rounds in a row. Also, my mother-in-law really enjoyed this one. So it became a popular one to bring over to Brenda's house. Um, also up there because to review it, we played multiple games to get the core game down, but then played more games to play with the expansion to be able to talk about that separately. So well, I got to say, this one's rough. Um, I feel sorry for Mark because this one is not winning fans over because there's some system mastery and rule mastery required to get into this game. I personally think it's worth it, but it's a hard sell to say, hey, you got to play this game two, three times before you really start to enjoy it. Most people would rather play a game that's fun right out of the box. So a little bit of a rough start for all the boss, but I dug it. It is my number five most played game of 2022. My number five most played game is Sushi Go Party. Uh, they finally added this on Board Game Arena, and we jumped onto it as soon as that happened. Uh, it really is the better version, I think, mm -hmm. of Sushi Go. Not that there's anything wrong with Sushi Go, but the card variety and the fact that your card, the potential cards change every game just makes yep. it so much more enjoyable to play mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Uh, so uh, you can't go wrong with Sushi Go Party. So that's one I should try to convince you to buy because it's one I don't have, but yeah, I should for the public play events. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely should. That one, that one should be one I think should be in Sean's collection. Hey, we talked about this earlier. Yes, I played a lot of Tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed it's so high. Um, I have more than 10 plays of a big epic game like that. But again, Board Game Arena gets the real credit for that. But I played a lot of physical games of tapestry yeah. uh we played that with tori and cat we played even holly uh snail runs in the chat has played tapestry we played a lot of tapestry um later on though we did move to mainly playing games online and i started a new game of tapestry whenever one finished and explored so many different factions 
Fair enough. So my number four was uh, Tigris and Euphrates, a game that, again, I have never read the rules to. <laughs> oh, unlike, that game's rough. Unlike Deus, however, I'm actually pretty good at Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, winning more than losing, uh, nice. despite never figure, uh, never actually reading the rules. This one does actually, it's easier to figure out. Things become more obvious, I think, than Deus does. It's pretty straightforward what you're doing. It's not easy. Um, yeah. a, we were playing, you know, four player game of this is there is cutthroat. Um, it's a, it's a rough game and I can definitely see a lot of people not enjoying this game, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I clearly enjoyed it enough despite not understanding it at first to, uh, to have it come in as my number four. I wonder if, um, does BGA have yellow and Yangtze? Because that is actually a follow up to Tigris and Euphrates, rethemed to China instead of Egypt. Hmm. Um, that's supposed to be a little better. I'll have to see. I just wonder. So, Tigers and Euphrates, the story I have about this one is I've been on Board Game Arena more longer than most people. I joined in 2002, I think it was. And back then, the number one game in the world was Twilight Imperium. Or not Twilight. Yeah, Twilight, Twilight Struggle. Sorry, I'm confusing the two. Twilight <laughs> Struggle, the Russia versus U.S. card game, war game. Some people get upset I called it a war game. Um, and the number two game was Tigris and Euphrates. And Board Game Geek had licensed the game from Nizia. And underneath the, the old logo for Board Game Geek, before they switched to the guy running with the checkerboard, was a button to play Tigris and Euphrates. And I tried to do that. And it just pissed off people on Board Game Arena because they were taking the game way too seriously. And I was obviously playing wrong. And that that is my history with it. But because of that, I'm like, oh, this is like this heavy, hard chess lovers love it. Huge strategy game. I go to go buy a copy of it. So I went and picked up a copy of Tigris and Euphrates, which is behind me. It's just right above my thumb there. Um, and I think I tried to play it twice and didn't like it at all. <laughs> So maybe Sean needs to teach me Tigris, even though he hasn't played read the rules for Tigris. Yeah, maybe I'll have point. to read the rules to actually teach them. But I, you know, I, I, I'm actually, I was actually decent at it. So maybe, yeah. I, maybe I can work. An interesting it out. one. Yeah. Uh, next one makes perfect sense. Charterstone, because well, we played 13 times, 12 times to finish the campaign, and one more to try it after we finish the board in order to do up our full review. Um, since then, I did pick up the recharge pack, so this might be on the list at 12 plays in 2023. Uh, number three for me, Azul. Uh, sadly, not physically. Um, <laughs> but thank God the Board Game Arena added this game because I love Azul. It's mm -hmm. such a fantastic game, and if I can't play it physically, at least the implementation on Board Game Arena is as close as you can get except for wanting to throw the little files in your mouth because they look like candies. Yep. Uh, my number two is Azul. So um, I know I said I didn't play much board game arena, but I really did uh, less this year than last year, but I played a lot of Azul. There were a few months there where we just had two to three games of Azul going at once. And the big thing we were doing was diving into it on the um, the blank side. We played a lot of games on the blank side, which I was terrible at. And I honestly admit, by the time we finished all those games as well, I think I was worse at the game than when I started. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of as well. Um, some physical play. My, my physical copy did get played, um, but mostly on Board Game Arena. I'm still, I'm, I'm a little shocked that it, that it was that high up. Number two, I didn't realize we played that much as well. But it's so <laughs> quick. Like, it's not a long game. And if you, Deanna, and I happen to all be on the computer and live, we'd fire through two, three games in a row. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Now, when it comes to quick games, uh, one that doesn't always seem quick on Board Game Arena, but actually turns out to be pretty quick, uh, especially if you may have three or four games going at once, it turned out, uh, is Go Nuts for Donuts. Uh, another great party game, and again, a, a game that's just so easy to, you know, throw off a turn now and then on Board Game Arena that you just lose track of how much you're actually playing the game, it turns out. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I have played a whole lot of Go Nuts for Donuts this year. And honestly, I've never played the game. I haven't even tried it on Board Game Arena. I have never played Go Nuts for Donuts. All right, my number one played game of the entire year of 2022, not counting the games we're probably going to play Friday night, New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is technically like if we don't start till midnight, it'll count for next year's <laughs> list. 
We'll see when I log my plays where they fall. Um, my number one game, and I don't think that'll change before the end of the year, is Codenames Duet. Um, this one also gets blamed on date night gaming for the most part. This was actually Deanna and I's favorite game to play with some charcuterie and craft beer and sit and hanging out. Um, we even went and got like the not safe for work pack, which I strongly recommend not picking up um, because it was date nights. So we thought that'd be fun, but it's just mostly dumb. We took like half the cards out because it was more about like drugs and violence than interesting, sexy things. Uh, so yeah, don't can't, can't recommend Undercover, I think it's called. But yeah, we played a lot of Codenames Duet, uh, especially earlier in the year. Um, but we also played the game with the kids and Tori and Kat, our usual game group, because we ended up loving the co-op version, like the, the not-two-player, the team-based, really team fun team-based game. And that's when it replaced Codenames for me. Like I literally threw out my Codenames box and I stole the cards from it. Like, technically, I have the clue cards if we want to use them. But, yeah, so Codenames Duet, my most played game. I, If you would ask me, that wouldn't even been in my top ten, like, if I was thinking about it. But that's another one where you, like, play a round, play another round, play another round, play another round, especially if you lose right away. Now, yep. the other thing is Deanna had made a pocket pack, and we condensed ours down to one Ziploc bag that she'd throw in her purse, and that's what we bring to Kingsville. So we'd be playing in the hotel room. We'd be playing at Band of Goose. We'll be playing at the Grove Brewery. And it's it's never one round. You always at least flip the cards and play a second round. And I will say our average game of Codenades Duet is actually four rounds because we'll play a set, flip the cards, and we'll put a new set of cards, flip those, and then usually we move on to something else. So it was up there. Like like number of plays was was multiple digits. <laughs> and I'm like, it's got to be because of that because I actually logged each of those as separate plays. Right. Uh, my number one, I probably would have guessed. Uh, because yeah. up until they released Sushi Go Party, Sushi Go was the one that had three or four games going at once, mm -hmm. constantly playing over and over again. So every day I would be taking at least one turn on three or four different games of Sushi Go. Uh, so the, the play count on that one ranked up real fast, uh, even though we were down to maybe, I think there's maybe one game of it sort of going on in the background still, uh, despite all the Sushi Go Party going on. Mm -hmm. um so yeah sushi go uh again it party is better but uh there's still nothing wrong with the original so is your online group you play with now switched completely to party or do you still have games of go there's going one game of go that has never ended which we just keep go. restarting it over and over again yep. with eric and the gang i will say one thing that's kind of nice compared to previous years is seven wonders is not on my list at all <laughs> we finally got out of yep. that rut where all three of us just kept like playing Seven Wonders indefinitely on Board Game Arena. Yeah. I don't know how it happened, but somehow an invite got missed, and finally that well, stopped. I, I, it's funny some of these some of these games, you know, a lot of the group the group will just move on to something else, and we won't play that game anymore. Uh, yeah. Even if no one is is actively turning down invitations, sometimes it's it's oh no, I really don't want to play that anymore. But yeah. a lot of times it's just you know no, we played that a bunch. Let's move on to something else. Fair enough. All right. So there's our top 10 played games. Our top 20. I don't know how many different games. It wasn't 20 because we did no, have wasn't. a bit of overlap. Yeah, it was 15 um, in there or something like that. <laughs> 15 or so games we played the most in 2022 with a mix of in-person and digital gaming. Next up, how many of these games were new to us? Uh, new to me games. And for me, it was over half. I, I was actually surprised by that. It was better than I expected. Um even though they weren't all new games, which we'll get to a minute, as in like most recently released, um, some are fairly older. 48 of the games were new to me. So 48 brand new game discoveries in one year to me is pretty good. I know it's nothing compared to the number of games that are released in a year. But for me, when we're still, you know, I'm not hosting a ton of public play events. I didn't go to any cons. 48 games is pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Absolutely. And I was only a few less with 40 new to me games nice. this year. Uh, and given that I couldn't always play many that we reviewed, only eight fewer than you feels pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm happy with that. I'm really happy with that. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was my biggest surprise. It's something we've done every time we've done one of these lists. And my biggest surprise of the year is, but you know what? There were too many, like there, and they were pleasant. Like there, there was no shockingly bad thing that happened, at least not as far as gaming goes um i just i can't pick one this year so i'm I'm gonna cheat and and list off a few pleasant surprise the most pleasant gaming surprises of 2022 um not in any particular order 
So the first one is that big box over my shoulder right there, which would be Scythe from Stonemaier Games. Um, the fact they gave it a second chance isn't really a surprise. I've been meaning to do that for years. I have to thank Jamie Stegmeyer for finally giving me the opportunity to give the game a chance. And I thought maybe that first experience didn't go so well and I might like the game. I didn't expect to fall in love with this game. Like, like this is a fantastic game. The components are fantastic. Every time I play it, I enjoy it. I try different strategies. I love the miniatures and little things like plastic things can fight and wooden things can carry. And there's so much awesome design work in there. Two layer player boards, just really impressed by Scythe. Not only that, I have to love Scythe because somehow it has become the most popular thing on our blog now is my Scythe review. So I don't know why, like, I'm glad other people are still discovering Scythe this many years later. So I don't know. I, I know, like, I'm late to the party. It's 2022 and I'm talking about Scythe, but that was a huge surprise to me. Not that I liked it. I had a feeling, like, knowing I like other Stonemaier games, type of games I like, but just how much I like scythe yeah and and this one comes in for me as well well i hadn't played it physically the digital game which everyone had you know gone on and on and on about it's just as disappointing for me as you know uh as mo had felt about uh, playing it in person uh and until i played it with the gang down in windsor i, I didn't get the game it just Mm -hmm. I completely not clicked for me. It wasn't enjoyable. I didn't want to try the, dig <laughs> the, the digital version further to try and find a way to enjoy it because it just, it hadn't, it hadn't felt right. right. Uh, and then playing it with the right people make me understand the game a little better. And, and why I wasn't struggling with uh, the, the strangeness of it. It was, you know, explained well and, and clearly, and it was just fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Heck, I even played that one solo. I don't do that very often. <laughs> now, have you gone back to the digital version now that we played a bunch? I, I have gone back a couple of times. It's not installed right now because it's just... I'm just wondering if it's worth picking up if you're a fan of the other... If the, the fan of the physical version and know I, it. I, I think so. I think it really is. Yep. It's, it's, it's a good implementation of it. Nice. All right. Another big surprise for me was Gunkimono or kimono we we had a way to pronounce this we looked it up at the time Gunkimono. Was, Gunkimono. um this is a fantastic abstract strategy game that i would have missed i would have never touched this game i would have never looked at this game i probably would have forgot its name eventually the only reason i even tried this is a local gamer was purging their collection and i bought a lot of games off them like a lot is in like an, an ebay <laughs> lot of stuff but it was also a lot of games <laughs> But I bought them in a, and there was a huge number of Renegade games in that collection for a good reason. And it was just one in the pile. And I'm like, oh, well, let's see. I opened it up. I'm like, eh, it's already punched. Let's try this out. And Deanna and I played. And I was like, is it just me or was that really good? She's like, yeah, let's play again. And then we finished the second game. And I'm like, all right, now I'm seeing some stuff I missed the first couple. You want to go again? And like, that doesn't happen often with, with a bigger game, like with a point salad, sure. But like, we're looking at out, I don't know if it's an hour play, two players, but whatever, 45 minutes to an hour game that we wanted to play again. And then we're like, okay, let's see if it's good with three. Oh, yeah, it's good with three. Okay, let's try it with four. Okay, we got to try it with five. And the, the way the map is all hilly and mountainy at five. So yeah, big surprise for me. And, and a big hit was Gunkimono. Well, all right then. Well, for me, I'm going to go with a more recent discovery, which was Cowboy Bebop. Now, being a fan of deck builders and the anime, I'd sort of been expecting to enjoy it. Yeah. But that was about as high as my expectations had run. To discover that they had introduced new mechanisms into a deck building game and done inventive things with it for a mm -hmm. licensed title deck builder that could have just been your generic deck builder with all the flat trimmings of uh of cowboy bebop really made this stand out as a fantastic game even without the license mm -hmm. uh, and then you add the license in and the fact that they it's it's themed well with the license really made this game stand out and just to be clear, that's Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, as there are multiple Cowboy Bebop games out there. Yes. 
Uh, for me, the next one is Pocketbook Adventures, which I misplaced. So one problem with Pocketbook Adventures is it's a small book. It's somewhere in this room. I would be holding it up right now. Uh, this is a solo-only game. This is this is a single-player thing. And honestly, I would not argue too hard if someone said it's not a board game, but rather like a puzzle, like crossword puzzle book, I, which is kind of a fair argument. But this ended up being the perfect thing for me to play while sitting in my van. And honestly, it's something I do a lot. Uh, people have appointments. My daughters have therapy. They have music. They have things they go to. And I spend a lot of time sitting in my van. That's usually where I read rule books. When I don't feel like reading something, this was an awesome thing for me to be able to sit and play. Um, now, in all fairness, I played this in 2022. You can't get it. So for me, this this was a 22, 2022 surprise. So glad that I got to check this out. And yes, I really pushed the Kickstarter when it was live because I really enjoyed this. I think this is one of the, a great time lister. But then if you ever in your life subscribed to Games Magazine or went to the corner store and went, oh, I'm going to buy an issue of Games Magazine and had fun with it, you're going to love Pocketbook Adventures. All right, well, staying on theme for me, Chiseled, the opposite of a deck builder, I guess, was mm. so much more than expected. Oh, yeah. Uh, rather than a simple, oh, how cute that is game that was kind of what we expected, I, it gets played, but uh, when we never expected to really sort of play it again. You know, five plays, it's done. Here we go. Okay, we, mm -hmm. we'll review this. It's fun. Everyone enjoys it. We're never going to play it again. I would play this game just about any time. And the fact that it's super easy to teach mm -hmm. means that, you know, it's a fantastic game for public play events and such. Uh, and it looks good on the table. It doesn't it doesn't stand out from a distance, but people walking by are definitely going to notice the game. Yeah, that one was a huge hit when I we brought that out to the Barbershop Bar event, our only public play event this year. Uh, played two rounds of it. A great game. All right, next for me is Marvel Champions. Uh fantasy flight living card game that i actually liked i think that's why it's a shocker like i i've tried many i, I, I should like them i played magic i i don't even play i played magic i played jihad i played um galactic frontiers was one of my favorite i even played wing commander the collectible card game i was all about those back in the day and i quit because of the collectible nature so living card game should be my jam but everyone i try i just can't get into I, I tried Netrunner. I tried the Star Wars one. I tried the War Machine one. I tried all kinds of them. I tried Legend of the Five Rings, and I just couldn't get hooked. I think in this case, I may have found a living card game that's actually for me. Now, at this point, I'm only just starting to explore this one. Maybe it's ill-deserved. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking too quick, but I don't think so. And then there was Smash Up Disney, which, despite its branding, was not an nope. easier version of Smash Up at all all <laughs> merely one that was just as in-depth as any other smash up offering but featuring fun disney characters <laughs> and, oh. and this was this was fun and again the 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 timing of discovering this um uh, as i had i had just just discovered marvel snap uh, yeah, made timing. for a nice synchronicity uh because while they aren't the same there's enough similarities that my my headspace was in the right place yep. to sit down and really get smash up. And there's more, there's tons like, like the, how much we actually enjoyed our campaign in Charterstone. I actually thought that was going to be a slog based on other reviews I'd seen or how damn good cowboy bebop space serenade is. Sean's already called it out. It is so good. It is one of the best deck builders I ever played or I totally missed that. I would have never guessed this was 2022, but it ends up, we played this on new year's Eve after midnight and that was WWE superstar showdown. It's actually a good game. It needs expansions, <laughs> but it's a good game. It's a licensed WWE game. That's good. Like that, th those words shouldn't go together. It's it's baffling. <laughs> you know, with the number of games we play, especially with the need to cycle through games rapidly for reviews for this show, uh, without the ability to play over and over at event the way things used to work, mm -hmm. it's been hard to keep track of all the ups and downs these last couple of years. Oh, yeah. Thank goodness for Board Game Geek and BG Stats, the app, for helping be our memories during these times. Yeah, shout out to BGG for me. I still don't use BG stats. I should. I keep meaning to install it, and I never do. <laughs> um, I, I got to answer more Google surveys, and then when I get it up there, I'll, I might actually have to do that. So overall, 
there were so many new discoveries last year. Out of all of those, though, if I had to pick one game to top them all, my 2022 game of the year that has nothing to do with 2022 other than the fact I played it for the first time in 2022 has got to be Lost Ruins of Arnak. It is one of my most played games, and for all the right reasons. It does everything right. Every game is engaging. Every game is fun. It changes things up. It's replayable. I like the way it makes me think. I love eking out that combo of one more action that leads to another action that i go up on the track and when i go up the track i get the thing to spend the thing to buy the card that lets me do this other thing that lets me put my worker here i love that feeling in that game that that logic puzzle i guess of the game no other game compares for making me feel smart after a big move like that (laughs) and you do love engine builders which is really i mean that's really what we should be calling arnak not deck builder it's an engine builder um Mm -hmm. it's it's just an an engine builder of a wide range of other mechanisms yep so i really can't disagree with that uh for myself as well though i have to say if i had been in windsor i probably would have tried to make dune imperium (laughs) the arnak because while i like arnak um I'm the sci-fi guy. I like the sci-fi games and I am a lover of Dune, uh, not only the game, but also the, uh, the entire license. So I would have probably uh, leaned on playing a little more Imperium and a little less Arnak, but Arnak is available on board game arena. So it had the advantage this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dune Imperium. I've only still played twice. So that one, we're still just scratching the surface. All right. I know we try to keep things positive here, um, and uh, but I know everyone also always wants to hear it, right? Um, my biggest disappointment of 2022 would be the Tales from the Loop, the board game. I love Tales from the Loop. I love the setting. I love Steinman Stalin Hogg's artwork. I love his art books. I love the role-playing game. No, I still haven't watched the Amazon series, so I can't tell you on that one. I keep forgetting it exists. I love the premise. I love kids on bikes. I had no clue. Before playing a game of Tales from the Loop at a con with Sean, um, I would have said, I don't want to play kids in the 80s. I was a kid in the 80s. I don't want to do that in a game. But it was so fun. I love the look of this game. It looks like it nails Tales from the Loop. Yeah, it would have been kind of cool if it was in Denver and not in Sweden because I don't have to worry about pronouncing things. But the components were awesome. The little miniatures were great. The characters were right from the role-playing game. The stats were right from the role-playing game. It just felt like it should have been amazing. And it didn't live up to any of those expectations. And I don't even think we were being unreasonable with the license that's there, with the design team, with the role-playing game, and the tying it together, this should have been a good game. Yeah, unfortunately, it just, it failed. I, 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 I think I know what they were doing. I think I know what they were going for. And it was just a swing and a miss, which happens sometimes. And, and yep. it's, it's unfortunate, mostly, I think, because we do love the property. Mm-hmm. Um, if it had just been some, you know, some property none of us cared about, we'd be, oh, look, it was another game. It didn't work. Oh, well, moving on. But yeah. we do love Tales from the Loop. And so it hurts that much more when something in that world doesn't work. <laughs> yep. Now, with that, as a more general disappointment is, I'm going to say, rule books. <laughs> now, while most of the larger publishers have got this sort of thing pretty well handled, Many of the smaller publishers, uh, not just the, uh, you know, the independents, still are what making to me are unforgivable errors in rule books on delivery. Even if all the rules do happen to be in the rule book, if you can't find them when you need them, what's the point? Yeah. And we're not just talking about Kickstarters and prototypes here. Published games that we have purchased that are available on retail shelves If experienced hobby gamers like us with years of experience are having difficulty figuring out your game, there's a problem. All right. So far, all the games we talked about were new to us games or games we played in the past that we got in more plays in 2022, but haven't actually talked about actual 2022 games. Um, Many of the games we're talking about, like Scythe and Arnak, were actually released quite some time ago. Now, I'm going to use Board Game Geek for this. 
or the release dates, which I don't quite understand. Like Horizon Zero Dawn supposedly is a 2020 game. Is that when the Kickstarter was live? Yeah. So that's I the problem with Board Game Geek is the editor goes in and says, or you know, whoever goes in and says, well, we're starting this game and they need to it has to be a, a date in the now, really, you can't, right. or, or near future. Um, and so the games that are, you know, if you can, if people have the game and have, are playing it, the date has to be then. So, you, you know, if re reviewers are playing your game, it has to be released. So yeah. even though it wasn't necessarily on shelves, if someone was playing it, it, it was released, I guess. And the added complication is we are reviewers and sometimes we are sent games from publishers and we do sometimes get stuff before it's in retail. So we may play it before other people get it too. So it's kind of a mess. So I used BGG's number, wherever it comes from, whatever it's based on using that. And this is sad. I only played six games that were released in 2022. Like, like that just, uh, I, 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 we joke about us not being about the new hotness, but I didn't realize we were that far off the mark. <laughs> um, so you know what? There's only six, so we may as well talk about each of them quickly. Um, all the boss. I already talked about all the boss. Everything you need to know about all the boss. All the boss doors of Cartagena from Grand Gamers Guild. Um, next up was Mountains Out of Mole Hills, which is a family weight programmed movement game with great table presence from the op, um, which probably might have been in my most played games if more time had gone by. We only tried this one recently. Um, next is Boba Mahjong. This is a three player set collection game uh, with a unique scoring system from Sunrise Tornado, who we loved Macaron, a trick taking game from. This is obviously Tate Wu as the designer is all about taking traditional card games and doing interesting new things from them. And I can't wait to see what he has to do next. Uh, next is another op game. Well, actually, we have a lot of op games here. Four of these are op. Okay, obviously the op sent us review copies it's kind of <laughs> funny now that i see it here in front of me uh next would be ven a venn diagram based word and art driven party game that now is the game that the kids at my daughter's grade or high school love because that's what she brings with her on board game weeks now um next disney sorcerer's arena a disney themed skirmish battle game that we're just starting to discover and finally smash up disney edition which sean talked about earlier yeah, as well as Aldebus, uh Boba Majon, we did both plays Tales from the Loop, which is a 2022 game. Um, see, when I looked it up, it wasn't listed as 2022, oh, I thought. See, I had it as a 20. I had it listed uh, as a 2022. See, I don't I even know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was for better or worse on Tales from the Loop. Uh, interestingly, I actually have a different uh, 2022 game that you haven't played, which is uh, the trick-taking game Las Vegan which came out this year, though my plays were, of course, only digital. See, I couldn't even find that one on Board Game Geek. Is that a real game? Yeah, yeah, it's on Board Yeah, it's a real game. It's a real, or, sorry, real game. Not board, yeah, I couldn't find it on Board Game Geek. Yeah, it's on It's on there. Okay. I, they all, all my, all my plays, because I, I, because Board Game, BG Stats publishes to Board Game Geek, right. I, I can still go in and, and check oh. all my plays from Board okay. Game Geek, and I, I tabbed open everything. See, I actually thought you started playing Las Vegas, which I think is a Nizia game, but it's a dice game. <laughs> nope. Right? Which, whereas, as you're saying, trick-taking game, so that's not it. And honestly, like, probably on that list should be Horizon Zero Dawn, but again, we barely played it. Now, I gotta say, one of the reasons we didn't get to as many is because of October and November. There was stuff we had on the plate to be played before the end of the year that fell through just because those two months were horrible, void of terribleness so we 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 didn't even record podcast during that time there was no gaming going on so there would have been more on here like we had uh the three different valeria games that we had some other stuff i had hoped to get played so out of the ones i have played from 2022 uh, i think mountains on the molehills would be my favorite excuse me i think mountains on the molehills would be my favorite uh both because the kids love it and because i think this can be fantastic for public play events yeah, you know what? While I enjoyed most of the uh, 2022 games I played this year, uh, most, not all, um, <laughs> I, I found them not quite in hitting any sweet spot. Um, realistically, I wouldn't say any of them are my favorites. Uh, the okay. game, Most of the games that really did it for me this year were older games we were just fi finally trying yeah. to uh, explore. Yeah, and I have a feeling we're going to be talking about a lot of 2022 games next year. We're going to finally get to pick up some of these games people have been hyping. 
Now, while looking up these games, I did realize we also I also have plays of games that don't exist. Um, uh, they were Kickstarter previews where we played the games, but you can't get them yet. Um, in one case, it's a game that funded, but the other actually didn't fund. Um, I, and there's more of those actually, like the Earth is ours or whatever it was called. I can't remember now. The the time travel game. Mm. Now, the thing is, these are both solid games that I would recommend, and I think Sean would even recommend the first one, which is Hellbringer. This is a roguelike, Diablo-based card game meant for solo play that can be played with more players, though we don't didn't really love it with more players. Uh, we both really enjoyed this one solo, and we're really sad to see it not fund in its first attempt. Now, the designer, though, has realized some of the issues with his first launch, I think, and has big plans, plans for a relaunch. And we're not getting anything out of this, but I'm definitely going to be promoting it when it comes out, because I think more people deserve to play this game. If you are a fan of roguelike deck builders and dig card mechanics and battlers killing lots of monsters, I think you're going to really like this game. Yeah, absolutely. And March 1st is currently the date it's scheduled to go live again on Kickstarter. So we'll see what's on offer in the new funding attempt. And then the other one I already talked about a bit above is Pocketbook Adventures. This is one I honestly wish I had backed just so Dee and Sean could have their own copies. I should have bought like the five pack <laughs> and given them out to people as gifts or something this year. I just want to compare scores. I want to know how many hearts everyone gets by the end. They're like, how'd you do against the first orc boss? Did you manage to get the treasure chest? Yeah, you know, the solitude of it doesn't go well with our group uh, in general, though it has been great for your waiting time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's been great for me, so I don't know. So the one thing we haven't talked about at all here is role-playing games. Don, I know you were running games, at least earlier in the year. Yeah, no, there's, um, it, it's been, <laughs> it isn't just you, uh, us that have had rough, uh, rough falls. Yeah. It's, it's been that way for a lot of people. So both of my game, both the game masks I'm playing in and running have had some hiccups over the last couple of months. But there, I am still involved in, in two masks games, uh, one, both, one as GM and one as player. See, that's awesome. Anything other than masks or just masks this year? Sadly, uh, just masks. Um, I, <laughs> I can't wait to get back to a con and, and do some one-offs and learn some more stuff. And while I do need to find some time, I need, the, the one thing that hasn't happened since I've moved down to Windsor is I haven't found a reading time. Um, right. I used to have a couple of specific times where I would sit down and read a new RPG. Uh, and that hasn't happened here so i'm falling behind and i i'm not at a point where i feel even remotely comfortable i could do another superheroes episode right. despite having new games that i could talk about um or new to Fair me enough. games at least but uh hopefully i'll 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 find a rhythm and uh you know maybe a, maybe a sunday afternoons after brunch i sit down and read a book there you go you gotta we gotta find a coffee shop that's open after four and oh, then tell me about it <laughs> Tallulah Cafe is probably your best bet. Tallulah right. near near uh, Walkerville there. Uh, so sadly, this year, I didn't play anything. I didn't run anything. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. I just double-checked. I'm like, there had to be something. I guess those were all last year. Um, Runaway Hirelings. I guess that was last year. Must yeah. have been. Yeah, it was. Wow. So yeah, nothing. Nothing. Nada. Um, now, to be fair, I tend to only play RPGs at cons, and I didn't go to money. So that's not that strange. No, for the queen, it has to be on there. The night we played with Tori and Cat, that was this year. It's got to be this year. Is it listed as a board game? Is that the problem? Is it not on RPG Geek? Probably. I wonder if that's what it is. I swear for the queen was this year. Dan will probably correct me in the chat, but I could have sworn it was. Yes, yeah, that, that was, was this year. year. So yeah. yes, we had a fantastic, amazing game of for the queen. So my best RPG experience this year was blowing Tori's mind by playing for the queen. Cause uh, you had to be there. What, what's happening? This is the game. Are we playing right now? What's my character? That, that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> is this the game? Did we win? Did we win? 
Oh, I, 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 I just, I'm smiling about it right now. <laughs> Those that can't see me live, I got a big grin right now just thinking about that game. So, yes. Now, what I did do is read some RPGs. I did get some new RPGs. We reviewed some RPGs. So, we had the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set, which looks amazing. Warhammer 4th Edition looks like Warhammer 1st Edition improved, I got to say. Uh, but, wow, it's it's Warhammer. It's not d d it, it, There's very little hand-holding going on. There's very little onboarding. It just kind of throws you in head first and warhammer's always been like that 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 is not an intro module but to be honest i cut my teeth on the enemy within so uh, the the reason i am the dm now is possibly because of being tossed in with here's just all the stuff here's what (laughs) the bad guys are doing you got some characters go because that's kind of how it's presented um so yeah i've been working through the one ring and I got to say, it looks amazing. The One Ring starter set, another, like I love RPG box sets, but these are amazing, amazing RPG box sets. The One Ring starter, I had hoped to start a game. That was another October, November um, casualty there. We had we were planning to start up a game of the One Ring. So most excited to play. Best, best RPG I read, it's got to go to One Ring. One Ring had the onboarding. One Ring had a fantastic story. The way they limited that box down to just the Shire and the Hobbits was amazing. And James Spawn's writing, Obi Spawn Kenobi's writing for the Hobbit book is is off the charts. Really uh, and, impressed and by that. And the content in that box. I mean, there was oh, yeah. just so much. Uh-huh. So yeah, best, best RPG of the year. I didn't get to play it. I didn't get to run it but I'm going to give it to the one ring starter set. Is that actually, that even might be a 2022 release. Mm, possibly. Might, yeah. Might be. This, this is the part of the show. I didn't research. Cause I realized, <laughs> Hey, we didn't talk about RPGs at all. And we both, well, it's because we don't really both play RPGs right now, Yeah, but we were. So, yeah. so I, I'm going to jump over to the chat room here. So is there any other categories you can think of or anything the chat room can think of that we haven't covered something you want to know about that we played in 2022 uh, i know uh pax is saying at one point the thing we need to work on in the uh, in the new year is the sean must playlist <laughs> yes oh i know what i should do is maintain what you did play off that list so so mm. off the top of my head we'll get sean's opinions on the games i showed him and the biggest <laughs> one being anachrony right which was fantastic i mean that game talk about a game like a tough concept for any game to handle yeah. is time travel. And I mean, it just knocks it out of the park. Um, yep. It's one of those, why do I want to play any other games? Time travel. That game. time travel? Uh, yeah. This one just did it right. Yeah. Send yourself resources from the future, but make sure you pay them back in later turns. That's pretty much the concept. Yeah. And sometimes you don't want to, because paradoxes aren't always terrible. Yeah, no, it, it's got so many wonderful mechanisms and it's not just the time travel i mean all the you know the waking up your your troops yes. and, and, and yeah there's... how do you wake them up do you, do, you, do you just get up get up or do you feed them yeah, yeah no there's all this fantastic stuff and we've still really only kind of scratched the surface oh yeah <laughs> well the amount of expansion content i own for that game i've never touched is actually shameful yes. um Eclipse, I think, was last year. I don't think we got that. That didn't show up on my playlist. So I think we did yeah, no, Second that, Dawn that last year. I don't think that showed up on mine either. So, yeah. Yeah. So Anachrony, I think, was the big one that I got off the Sean, excuse me, Sean Must playlist. A lot of it was, was stuff we already talked about, right? Scythe was one. Arnak was one. Dune Imperium was one. Uh, we already know Sean preferred Dune Imperium over <laughs> over Arnak, at least for what he got to see. Gorin to win person, I know, was a big one playing the production copy. Um, I think there was an Azul version you hadn't played. Tapestry was another one. Like we got through a lot of them. What I need to do is get Sean to play the classics, but then I think we have to be in the right mood. I think we need a bigger game night well, there, where we play. There was a little bit of that, and I'm trying to go through because there was the night, uh, the weekend like that we, we did played. One night, eighteen twenty one. Concordia with us? Uh, no, but the Castles of Burgundy came out. Yeah. Uh, so we got that going. Uh, Castles of Burgundy, eighteen twelve. The, the yeah. whatever it was called. Yeah. Yeah. Not 1812. That's uh, more 18, of 18. 1928. Or 1928, making of the president. Now, wow. I can't even remember <laughs> I can't what it is even now. remember now. Steffen game. About yeah. the uh, election. Famous election in the States. Revolution yes. something. Yes, yes. Uh, but <laughs> what? Bad. Oh, because it was um, Sanctum. We finally got Sanctum. Nope. Uh, yeah, you had pl- never played that. I had played right. Sanctum. Um, and there was something else. Zulkin. Oh, it? yeah. Was Zulkin this year? Yeah, that was Zulkin. Was on, okay. uh, that was B, yeah, Zulkin. And then. See, that's when um, I forgot to log. 
Uh, what else? Um, trying to find my... I need to find the right list. There's too many ways of looking at... Uh, uh, where's my insights? Insights. There we go. There's the... Because uh, it's only going to be like one or two play games. But because uh, we played the mind, we played the game. Um... Yeah, Sean did not like the mind much. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, play Rack Racco, lots of Racco. Um, surprised yep. that didn't show up more on your list. Uh, <laughs> Terror, I, I, Terror below, we got out of the way. Um, Terror below, you want to play again though? I do, we yes. played that way too late. That that one doesn't count. Uh, Alien Frontiers. Um, or there was something else that we did that because there was. When we did All Sanctum, right. yeah, I don't know. I, I think we'll stop this, but we did play Sanctum. Yes. We did that, which you liked quite a bit, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, Super Motherload. Yes, yeah, yeah. I remember we played that. Yeah, so this was all back in May, which is why we're struggling right now to remember yeah, that's... all this. This was this was back in May, so. Uh, I gotta um... admit, I had multiple pages to look through, and I was, I was looking at my most played. I, I didn't talk too much about games I only played once. Yeah. All right, I think we're good then. I didn't say any new categories to look at. I'm going to come up with one more. What was the most beautiful game you played? What was the game you were just like, oh, my God, this looks so good? Oh, wow. Um, That's tough. I'm thinking Bebop. With, with the miniatures and yeah. the three different planets yeah, and the card know, art. They, they went like, over and above. It wasn't striking. Like, like Horizon Zero Dawn looks amazing. But something about Bebop, because it doesn't need to be in Bebop, I think. Right. Horizon Zero Dawn, Seam Forge, and they're supposed to look like that. I think Bebop might be my top pick for for best art. Yeah, what is just stills from the show? Yeah, it's hard. They they went over and above though. They didn't yeah, have to it, do it was any yes. of that. Any of what they did on that game. The um, fact that there's not just a giant board that takes up your whole table. Yeah, like the, like the design and everything that goes with the dual layer boards to hold stuff. Again, you know, we talked about it before. We it almost had to have been a Kickstarter that someone I, said, "No, I no, swear. let's just sell them. Let's just give it to everyone." <laughs> like, like it's just so weird. The fact you get your cardboard standees and miniatures in that one. Yeah, it, it's it's that that box again. That opening up that box and playing the game are both a delight. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. They really it are. really is good. Maybe that should have been my game of the year. I really liked Arnak though. <laughs> Now, now I might have reshifted it. This I should have said the game of the year for right now because <laughs> tomorrow morning I'll be like, oh my god, this is so good. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for our look back at uh, 2022. How many games did you get in last year? What were your favorites? What surprised you? Let us know in the comments or on social media. And if you didn't play 300 games, that's perfectly fine. If you only played five games last year, that's still awesome. Please don't consider us a benchmark to beat. And plus, I don't want to hear that you played 3,000 more than I did either. <laughs> the number of games doesn't matter. It's the fun you had playing them. Absolutely. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, before we get to the next segment, let's check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch to see how their 2022 went. If you couldn't be here live but would love to hear this chat, all you have to do is become a hotel guest at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. 